We're going to um, be in Matthew chapter 13 this morning. Why don't you turn there? Matthew chapter 13. This goes along, we're in the book of Revelation, but this goes along with it. And so I wanted to read from this passage. Actually, there's a lot of reading here. What do I want to do? Let's start in verse 18. Let's all stand. I'll read it out loud. You guys can follow along. It says in Matthew uh, 13, 18, it says, Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom of God and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself. You got that? He has no root in himself, um, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took, sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable, he did not speak to them. Then it goes on, and if you look down in verse 44, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden, is like treasure hidden. Can you, hey, Zach, can you give me a hand? Um, excuse me. Where are we at? Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, let's stop right there, and let's pray. Father, um, we just give you the morning. Um, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the fact that um, your word is something that holds together. Um, whether we're in the book of Revelation or whether we're in the Gospels, um, it was all spoken by the same God. You said in your word that uh, every scripture is literally God-breathed, inspired by God, and it's profitable for uh, instruction and for correction, and, uh, or excuse me, for correction and instruction and righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So Lord, as we get into your word, we pray that you would bless it and that you would be speaking to our hearts and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Um, in the, we've been going through um, talking about the seven letters to the seven churches, and um, one, of the, one of the points that um, I was making as we've been going through them is the fact that it really goes along really well with church history. 
And so you see in the very first letter, a letter that's written to a church with doctrinal purity and a church that's watching out for false apostles. And that really corresponds really well uh, to the early church, the church in the first century. The second church is the church that's under persecution. That's the church at Smyrna. And then slowly you see uh, corruption entering in. You see compromise entering in. By the time you get to the church at Thyatira, you got full-blown false doctrine in. And then you got a dead church. And then you got a church that comes alive. That corresponds to the uh, Church of the Reformation, and then you have an apostate church at the very end. And all those things are, are things that God prophesied in the New Testament, talking about the fact that, th that the church was going to go through that. And what's cool about it is that you see it, um, uh, see the same thing in church history. And like I was saying, it goes along really well with church history. Here's another thing. You got seven letters to seven churches, and seven in the Bible is a number of completeness, Right? And so that's kind of a picture of the complete church. And if you go through, as we've done, and uh, look at the different issues that come up in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you see churches in all their different aspects. Um, one of the things that you also have in the New Testament uh, is the writings of Paul. Now, Paul wrote 13 letters. Um, some people say 14. I would be one of those. 13 of them were signed by him. The 14th one would be the book of Hebrews. Uh, but 13, uh, the book of Hebrews was not signed by Paul. And uh, so that's why there's a question as, who do the, uh, as to who the author is. Um, of the 13 other letters, and what we're talking about is Romans and uh, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, and so on. Of those 13 other letters, four of them were written to individuals. For, for, so First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and the book of Philemon were all written to individuals. And so now you have nine letters that are written to churches, right? So we have seven letters that Jesus wrote to churches. We have nine letters that Paul wrote to churches. And out of those nine letters, two of the churches got letters addressed to them twice. So you have first and second Corinthians and first and second Thessalonians. And so how many churches did Paul actually write to? That he, letters that he signed. And there were seven of them. And that's kind, of, that's kind of an interesting thing. Another thing that you have, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Another thing that you have is what we just read in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be there um, for a few minutes here. In Matthew chapter 13, you have what are called the kingdom parables. And it starts off with the parable of the sower. And I didn't actually read uh, what Jesus said about the parable of the sower, but you guys are pretty familiar with that. What Jesus said was a sower goes out to sow some seed, and some fell, falls on the roadside, on the wayside. Some fell among rocks, some fell among weeds, and some fell on, uh, on uh, good ground and grew up and yielded a crop, right? And so Jesus goes through and he gives kingdom parables. And I don't know if you were counting them as, as I went through and read them. You know how many there are? Seven. There are seven of them. And so every time I, for, for the rest of the time that we're in the book of Revelation, if I ask you, do you know how many there are? What are you going to say? Yeah, it's always seven. That's what, that's what it's going to be. And so one of the cool things about the Bible, and it's one of the things that I was mentioning when I was praying about this stuff, one of the cool things about the Bible is that it all holds together. There's, it's, it's kind of a neat thing where you see these connections in different places. Now, obviously, Jesus wrote the seven letters to the seven churches, right? He's the one who spoke those things. Um, actually, John wrote them. Jesus spoke it. Um, he also did the seven kingdom parables. And so uh, it might be something that it, when, as we look at it, we might see that there's a connection between those. And that's exactly what you find. So in the kingdom parables, the first parable is about um, the church, um, or actually a sower going out, going out to sow some seed. And that fits really well with the church at Ephesus. And here's why. At the very beginning of the church, what the church was known for was sowing the seed of the word of God. That's what Jesus says the seed is. Sowing the seed of the word of God. And there was um, purity in the church. And there was this whole thing with apostolic doctrine being sent out to the wor world. And so I would just um, commend to you that the, the first kingdom parable lines up right well with the church at Ephesus. 
Then you have the second kingdom parable. Let's go through and look at that again. In verse 24 of Matthew 13, he says, Another parable he put to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, and while, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus gave um, the interpretation of that in verses 37 through 43. Now, I didn't read that. Let's go through and look at that real quick. In verse 37, it says, he answered to, to them. The apostles came and asked him to explain the parable of the, of the tares and the wheat. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The son of man will send out his angels, They'll gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I don't want to make it a, uh, this a Bible study on the, on the kingdom parables. I just want to show you the connection with uh, the uh, seven letters to the seven churches. If, if the first letter, or if, if the first kingdom parable applies to Ephesus, the sower and the seed, then the second kingdom parable should apply to Pergamos, and what, or excuse me, to Smyrna. And one of the things that you see in the letter to Smyrna is it's a, it's a church under persecution, and Jesus specifically mentions the activity of the enemy in that, par or in that uh, letter to the church. Jesus talked about Jews, people who said that they were Jews, but they were the synagogue of Satan. And being a Jew is a good thing, but being a false one is a bad thing. And it also talks about in that parable that there was going to be 10 days of persecution for the church. And so you have this infiltration into the church of this group of people who say that they're a synagogue of, uh, a synagogue of Jews, but they're a synagogue of Satan. And there is the activity of the enemy in opposing the church. And that's what you see in this, pa in this passage right here. You see an enemy who comes in and sows tares among the wheat. Now, one of the things about tares and wheat is they all, wheat and, wheat and tares look pretty much the same when they're first growing. But when a tare grows up, the fruit that comes from it is actually like a narcotic. It'll make you, if you eat it, it'll make you dull-witted and basically put you to sleep. And so when Jesus is talking about this wheat and the tares thing, he lets us know that in our midst are going to grow up people who aren't people who actually follow Jesus. And so he always warned about that. I like, I like that that Jesus does that because a lot of times people are looking at church and people in church and going, well, if, if the church is a good thing, shouldn't it be absolutely pure? Shouldn't everybody be just right on? Why do you have people in church who do this or who do that? You know, you know all, the, all the gripes, hypocrites and, and fakes and, and that kind of stuff. Well, Jesus said that was going to be happening. Okay, and so he, he warned us that that was going to take place. One of, the, one of the biggest problems with being a Christian is church. And the reason that the church is a problem is because there's people involved. If you ever find the perfect church, don't go there. You'll wreck it. I'm just messing around. But in any case, you have, you have that one. So the third one, um, the third letter to the, to, the, to the churches is that church at Pergamos. And you remember that Pergamos, the word itself means mixed marriage. And that corresponds to the time when the church got involved with the state and you had this weird thing happening that was never supposed to take place. Church and state are never supposed to be mixed up. The church is a kingdom of God on earth kind of, um, we're actually kind of infiltrating the earth and we're not supposed to be tied with the kingdoms of this world. The Bible talks about the fact that our citizenship is in heaven. It doesn't mean that I don't need to be patriotic and I don't need to be a good citizen. The Bible says all those things. But as soon as a state gets involved with a church, the church always becomes corrupt. And that's the, that's the way that it goes. And in the third kingdom parable, you have this parable of the leaven. Look at verse 33. 
Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman, woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now I've heard some teachings on that where it's like, oh, the church, you know, that's a good thing. That what, you know what leaven is. Leaven is, is um, yeast. And when you put yeast into flour or into dough, what it does is it causes the dough to rise. It mixes all in there and it causes the dough to rise. And it makes those really neat, you know, little puffy things, you know, that you have in your dough. The little, the little bubbles and stuff. So you make Wonder Bread instead of, I don't, I don't know, saltine crackers. Okay? That's the difference between dough without yeast and dough... I'm talking to the guy's lady. Um, dough without yeast and dough with yeast. Okay? And so... That, that's that picture. And so what people say is that um, the church is like leaven in the world. And what's happening is we're going through and we're kind of, I don't know, puffing, mixing in and puffing up the world. I don't know. I don't know how that goes. But in any case, it, it, it's, it's pictured as a good thing. Not from a Jewish perspective, though. And you've got to remember that when Jesus was teaching these parables, he was teaching them to a bunch of Jews. The, the 12 apostles were Jews. All the people that were listening were Jews. You know what three measures of meal is in the Jewish sacrifice? It's the fellowship offering. When you brought a fellowship offering to God, an offering where, where it's like a peace offering, where, where me and God are squared away and that kind of thing, when you brought a fellowship offering to God, it was three measures of meal. It was mixed with oil and stuff like that. Never with leaven. Never with leaven. Leaven is a picture of corruption. In fact, all those little bubbles in your Wonder Bread, that's, that's yeast gas. What happens is they get it, the, the little yeast things get in there and eat up the sugars in your dough, and then they're passing gas, basically, in your dough. And that's what makes it rise up. It's really gross when you really think of it. And so yeast in the Bible is a picture of corruption. Every time that leaven is used in the Bible... Um, it's used as a symbol of corruption. So Jesus, for example, warned the apostles not to uh, actually to beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And what he was talking about was their false doctrine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is talking about a guy who's in the church who's sleeping with his stepmother and unrepentant about it. And, and the leadership of the church, actually the, the whole church, is patting, patting themselves on the back about the fact that this is going on and they're not dealing with the issue. And Paul says in that passage, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And in that context, he's not talking about good things. He's talking about sin. And so when sin enters in, it spreads throughout the whole lump. And he's talking about the church in that, in that situation. And he says, what we need to do is we need to go through and we need to excise all the leaven. You get all the leaven out of the church so that you're pure. And he uses the example of, of uh, Passover, something that the Jews did during Passover. So if you're Jewish and you hear about leaven being put into three measures of meal and it's being done by a woman, it's like, that's not a good thing. You don't put leaven into the fellowship offering. And so, again, it's a picture of infiltration of the, of the enemy um, coming in. Oh, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. That wasn't the third parable, that was the fourth. Um, the parable of the mustard seed. Well, let's just do the leaven real quick. I'm out of order, okay? And so, when you're talking about the leaven in the meal, Thyatira, and that's the, that's the fourth church that was mentioned, Thyatira is mentioned as being a church that has false doctrine in it. Specifically, there's a woman, and it's the only, it's the only kingdom, or it's the only uh, letter to the seven churches that mentions a woman. And there's a woman in connection with it, and Jesus calls her Jezebel, and says that she's brought in false doctrine, and uh, that in the church itself, there are many who are following her false doctrine. And so you have a woman bringing, bringing in false doctrine, and the false doctrine had to do with sex and idolatry, all evil. Okay, and so that corresponds real well. Let's go back to the parable of the, mus of the mustard seed, verse 31. It says, another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Okay? Now that's the third kingdom parable, and if this, if this whole thing holds together, that would correspond to Pergamus. I already messed this whole thing up and talked about, yeah. So, 
you got to kind of switch it all around, get the tape, excise it, flip things around, cut and paste. I don't know what I don't know what you do with that. But the third the third letter is to Pergamus, and again that means mixed marriage. And there was a period of time when the church got got together with the um, with the state. And like I said before, it wasn't a good thing. In this passage, again, with the, with the parable of the mustard seed, you have a situation where, again, I've heard this taught, and I've heard it taught as a great thing. So a mustard seed, Jesus talks about, um, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. Now, normally, in Israel, when you plant mustard, um, what happens is it's a bush about this big. If you let it go, though, it can, it's kind of like a weed. It can, it can become a big tree in the sense of something larger, but not huge like what Jesus is talking about. And so the fact that it grows that, that a mustard seed grows that much and becomes that big is a little bit out of the norm. It's a little bit messed up in that sense. And then it talks about the birds of the air coming and nest in its branches. And again, I've heard this taught in a way where the church is like a mustard, mustard seed. It starts from a little, a little seed and it grows up and it becomes this big, huge thing. And all the birds of the air come and nest in the branches. And that's all the people who come to church and that kind of thing. Sounds great, except for birds in the first parable. When Jesus was talking about the parable of the sower, you remember that? The parable of the sower, some of the seed falls on the wayside. And the seed's the word of God. And when it falls on the wayside, the Bible says, Jesus says that the birds of the air come and steal away the seeds. And he compares that to Satan coming and stealing away the word of God out of people's hearts. There's this thing called expositional constancy when you're going through and you're interpreting a passage. If Jesus says birds are satanic in the first parable and he's on the same sermon talking to the same people, you can assume that birds all the way through the sermon are going to be bad. And so now you got this thing where, where a mustard seed grows up, becomes a tree, which is a little, bit, a little bit tweaked, and then birds, bad things, come and nest in its branches. And again, you have this whole thing with infiltration. Infiltration. And so the, the church becomes something that it's not. And then again, like I was saying, the church was married to the state. To the state. It became something it was not supposed to be. And in the uh, letter to the church at Pergamos, the Nicolaitans, who are false teachers are being um, tolerated. In the letter to Ephesus, the same guys, the Nicolaitans, Jesus said, you hate their doctrine, which things I also hate. By the time you get to Pergamos, all of a sudden their doctrine is being tolerated, and it's even in the church at that point. And so again, you have this infiltration. Okay, moving on to the, the fifth one. Am I right? One, two, three, four. The fifth one is the treasure hidden in the field. Verse 44. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sell, sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay. So kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Now, um, again, when I've heard this taught by some guys, uh, what some guys think is that the kingdom of heaven here, the treasure that's hidden in the field, is Jesus himself. Is Jesus a treasure? Yes, absolutely. Is he hidden in a field somewhere? No. He makes himself known. Okay, so Jesus isn't hidden anywhere. Okay, um, do, do I need to go and sell everything that I have to gain him? Yes, absolutely. Jesus talked about the fact that if I'm going to follow Christ, then it needs to be full-blown going for it, and nothing needs to be in between me and the Lord. But the fact that I need to follow Christ with everything that I've got and um, in this instance sell everything that i got doesn't mean that that's what he's speaking about. Let's flip it around. All the way through this parable, the field, what's the field been? Or excuse me, all of the way through these parables, what's the field been? And all the way through it's been the world. Sora goes out to sow some, some seed in the, in, in the field, it's the world. Uh, you, you have the uh, wheat and the tares. Again, it's the world. You have the whole thing with the uh, mustard seed and the ground and all that stuff. And it's the idea of the church in the world. And so if, it's been, if the field has been the world all the way through, expositional constancy would make the field the world again. And so when you're looking at this whole thing with the treasure hidden in a field... It's a picture of the fact that Jesus sees something in the world that's a treasure to him. 
And what he does is he goes out and sells everything that he has so that he can buy it. Does that fit? And again, the treasure is you. And what did Jesus give up for you? Well, he gave up heaven. That's one of the things he gave up. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 is that he didn't grasp on to literally his rights as God, but that he came down, and he came down in the form of a man, and he took upon himself not only the form of a man, but came in the form of a servant. And then finally he gave up his life so that he could gain you. And so the picture there is you see this whole field and Jesus recognizes that there is a treasure there and he comes and he gets it. Sells everything that he has so that he can buy that field. Did Jesus buy the field? If the field's the world, did Jesus buy the world? And you know what? The whole book of Revelation is about Jesus coming and taking back what he's already paid for. He comes and takes those believers that he's already paid for and he's going to take them into his kingdom. He comes and takes the world that he's already paid for and he's going to make that his kingdom. And so by the time we get to the end of the book of Revelation, you have Christ coming and taking, taking the, the kingdoms of this world and making them his own, like the Bible talks about. Okay, and so you have, again, that picture. So that would correspond to Sardis. Now, Sardis is a little bit harder because Jesus doesn't have a whole lot of good things to say about Sardis. He says about them that you've got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Okay? But he also says, you have a few names there in heart in Sardis who haven't defiled their garments. And he talks about the fact that there's a remnant. And in that passage, he says, as many as do not have this doctrine and talks about the fact that he wants them to hold on to what the way that they've heard and follow him. So there's a remnant hidden in the church at Sardis. And again, it corresponds to this. Then you have the parable of the pearl of great price. Verse 45. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant sinking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now again, I've heard this taught that the pearl of great price is Jesus. And that what we need to do is we know, need to go out and seek Jesus. And then when we find him, we sell everything that we have so that we can buy him. That's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It can, it can be looked at that way. But if you take it and you flip it around and you look at it the other way, it's a really cool thing. Jesus sees a pearl of great price. And again, it's you that he sees. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. And the joy that was set before him is all of you. All of you that were going to follow him, all, the, all of you that were going to commit your lives to him and, um, and, and live for him. And so that would make you the pearl of great price. And so again, Jesus goes and sells all that he has um, so that he could buy this pearl of great price. That's kind of cool, huh? Here's another thing about pearls. Where do pearls come from? Yeah, shellfish, oysters. That's where pearls come from. Are oysters clean or unclean to a Jew? They are unclean. So do Jews wear, wear pearls? No. And so what you've got is a situation here where Jesus, to a, to a Jewish audience, is talking about an unclean Jew. Or, excuse me, an unclean jewel. So he's talking about an unclean jewel that a Jew would never wear because it comes from an unclean animal, right? Now, it's not that Jews didn't buy jewels, but the only reason that they bought jewels was so that they could sell them to Gentiles, okay? And so when you're talking about this pearl, a pearl is a Gentile jewel. And you know how you get a pearl? You know how, you, how a, a pearl becomes a jewel? You, it has to be taken out of its place of origin, which means you go into the ocean, you find yourself an oyster, you pull that puppy up, you break it open, and you pluck out the jewel. And so it's got to be it's got to be taken out of its place of origin before it can ever become a jewel. So a Gentile jewel taken out of its place of origin before it can ever become an item of adornment. Does that sound familiar? And that's a picture of the church. That's a picture. The church today is mainly Gentile. And what Jesus does is he comes along and he plucks you out of the world and he brings you into his kingdom. And not only that, it's not just a plucking out of the world in the sense of he brought us out in the world, brought us to Calvary Chapel or, or for anybody that's listening on the radio, brought you to your church. 
it's not just that. The Bible says that he's going to come and literally take us out of this world before we become items of adornment. There's a passage in the book of Malachi that talks about the fact that God will make you his jewels. And so he brings us to be with him. And that's a great picture of the rapture. When you look at the church at Philadelphia, which is the next church that's mentioned, um, basically the church at uh, Philadelphia is just given a well done by Jesus. And the other thing that he promises them is that if they're faithful, that what he's going to do is deliver them out of the hour of tribulation, out of the hour of trial that's going to come upon this whole earth. In other words, he's going to literally pull them out so that they never even go through the time of the tribulation. And so that corresponds really well, too. And then finally, you have the parable of the dragnet, verse 47. And it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And when I read that, what I read is judgment. Read judgment. The, the righteous are spoken about, but the focus is on the wicked and the fact that the wicked will be judged. And that corresponds right well to Laodicea. You had a church that literally does not understand what position they're in. They're in a situation where Jesus tells them, um, if you don't repent, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Actually, he doesn't even say that. He says, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And he talks about the fact that they need to repent and buy from him clothes and buy from him uh, eye salve so that they can see and so on and so forth, gold and, and that kind of thing. And he lets them know that he's not even in their church. He's on the outside knocking, trying to get in. And so Laodicea is all about judgment. It's all about bad and all about rotten. And that's what you see in the final, final kingdom parable. And so what you have there, again, is a whole set of parables that look like they go right well with the seven letters to the seven churches. And like I was saying before, that's something that um, makes all kinds of sense because Jesus spoke those seven letters to the seven churches, and he also spoke the seven kingdom parables. At the beginning of the study, I mentioned the seven letters, the seven signed letters to seven specific churches by Paul the Apostle. And it just so happens that they line up really well with the seven letters of the seven churches also. Okay, and so the first letter to the uh, seven churches was to the church at Ephesus. And so which, which letter would you think would line up with the church at Ephesus? Yeah, the letter to, to, to Ephesus, the letter of Ephesians. And, and it does up, line up really well. In Acts chapter 20, when Paul was making his last statement to the... Uh, 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 to basically the Bible study leaders at the, at the, uh, in the town of Ephesus, what he warns them about is the fact that there were going to be wolves who came in and that what they needed to do was continue in God's word and be faithful to him. And so you see that being fulfilled in the letter to the church at uh, Ephesus by Jesus. And so those two line up. The second letter is a letter to Smyrna, and that's a church that's... Um, under persecution, they're suffering. Is there a letter to a church that's suffering? And there is. And that's the letter to the church at Philippi. Um, all the way through the letter of the, of the church at Philippi, um, what Paul um, enjoins on them is that they have joy in their suffering. That even though that they're going through certain things, they need to be continuing in their joy with the Lord. Pergamus is a third church, and again, it means mixed marriage, and it's a church that's compromising. It's a worldly church. And so is there a church that Paul wrote to that was known for its worldliness? And that would be the church at Corinth. When you look at the church at Corinth, they had all kinds of problems with, uh, with uh, Greek philosophy and the fact that they were trying to be like the world. Um, that whole thing that I talked about earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with the guy sleeping with his stepmother was an example of the church having the same kind of toleration towards sexual immorality that, even, that the world had. And actually, Paul says, you've gone over the top because even people in the world don't do that. And so you see all the way through the letters uh, to the church at Corinth that Paul is dealing with this worldly attitude. And in 2 Corinthians, basically 2 Corinthians is all about the church at Corinth ripping on Paul, the guy who... who 
who actually was involved in the beginning of the church because false teachers were coming in. And a lot of the stuff that you see is Paul addressing the fact that these guys are bringing in false doctrine, that they're not paying attention, and that, again, they're just acting like the world. Okay? And so the third letter to the churches, Pergamus, lines up with Corinth really well. Then you have Thyatira. And Thyatira was a church that was leaving the faith. They were in a situation where they were actually teaching false doctrine in their midst. And so any religious, uh, um, any piety that they had, anything that, they, that looked like they were actually following Christ was just nothing but religious externalism. It was religion on the outside, not a heart on the inside. And do we have a, do we have a letter to a church that was into religious externalism? Yeah, we do. That's the letter to the church at Galatia. And the church at Galatia, Paul talks about the fact that they started in the spirit, and what they started in the spirit isn't going to be fulfilled by the works of their flesh. That they started following Christ, but now they're just following religion. And so what they were doing was they had turned from a love for Jesus to religious externalism. And so again, the, the letter to Galatians lines up with Thyatira really well. And then you have the next one, um, the letter to Sardis. And what Jesus says to the church at Sardis is, you need to remember how you heard. You need to remember how you heard. In other words, what he's saying is, you need to have a refresher in the faith. And so there is a letter to a church that's literally a refresher in the faith. And that's the letter to the Romans. What Paul does in the letter to the Romans is he goes through and he outlines what the gospel is. And he makes it really clear to them. And in fact, in, in that letter, he addresses some of the Jews that were in danger of turning away from Christ and in, in danger of going back again into dead externalism. And so the book of Romans is a great one that lines up with Sardis. In fact, Sardis is, in church history, it would be the Reformation church, the church that started out alive and ended up dead. And that Reformation started with uh, Martin Luther reading the book of Romans, literally, and teaching through it. And so that lines up pretty well too. And then you have the church at Philadelphia. And like I, like I was talking about earlier, um, the church at Philadelphia is specifically mentioned as being a church that Jesus would deliver out of the hour of trial that was coming on the whole world. And that's a reference to his coming for the church. And so you have that with a church at Philadelphia. There is a letter that's written to one of the churches where Jesus' coming for them is mentioned in every chapter of both letters. And that's the letters to the church at Thessalonica. And so those are the Thessalonians. And so that lines up with Philadelphia. And then finally you have Laodicea. And the last letter is the letter to the Colossians. And one of the things that I, was, that I did last week when we went to, through the letter to Laodicea is showed you the connection with the book of Colossians. There are passages in the book of Colossians where idioms are used in that book that are used in the letter to the, to the church at Laodicea. And what Colossae was in danger of was leaving Christ through vain philosophy. The idea that they had a philosophy that didn't line up with what the word of God had to say. And that's exactly what Jesus says to the church at Laodicea. You think that you're rich and that you're wealthy, or excuse me, that you're rich and you're healthy and you have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. And so they had a philosophy that taught that they were squared away, and yet they were in a situation where they were not. And so you have that. And so seven letters, seven signed letters to seven specific churches that Paul wrote to, and they line up with the church at Ephesus too, or the, with the uh, letters to the uh, seven churches in the book of Revelation too. And I think that's pretty cool. So that's, that's an example of Steve going through and giving you all the weirdness that he gets into. And I don't know if you like it or not, but I don't care. So <laughs> anyway, it's pretty cool. Then uh, let's go over to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. In verse 1 and 2, we'll actually get into chapter 4. It says, After these things... I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the for first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, 
and one sat on the throne. And we're not getting any further than that. This begins the next section in the book of Revelation. Um, Jesus outlined the book of Revelation in chapter 1. And in that, why don't you turn over there real quick. Chapter 1 at the end of the chapter, verse 19. Jesus says to John, I want you to write the things which you have seen, which was a, which was a vision of Jesus. That, that whole vision where Jesus was standing there and he had white hair and blazing eyes and uh, uh, dressed with a white robe and a gold girdle around his waist and, and that whole thing. Write the things which you have seen. And he did that. And the things which are, and the things which are, it corresponds to chapter 2 and 3, the things of the church, and the things which will play, take place after this, literally metatata in Greek, after these things. And when you look at chapter 4, it starts off with metatata, after these things. And so the book of Revelation is divided up into three parts by Jesus. The vision of Christ in chapter 1, the things which are, which are the things of the church in chapters 2 and 3, and the things which would take place after these things, which would be presumably the things of the church in chapters 4 on. And what you have from chapter 4 on is a picture of our future. It's, a, it's the future of this planet. It's, the, it's your future specifically. The things that are going to take place in the future. One of the things that's going to take place in the future is that Jesus is going to come for you and he's going to call you to himself with his voice and with the trumpet of God and you are going to be either raised from the dead if you die or you are literally going to be translated, the Bible calls it. You are going to be changed while you're standing on your feet, laying in your bed, wherever you're at, you're going to be changed immediately into the same kind of form that Jesus was changed into after his resurrection. And the Bible says that you're going to meet Christ in the air at that point. And that's called the rapture of the church. Okay? And so the Bible's really clear on this. In fact, let me, let me read you a passage that deals with that just to give you kind of, kind of the definition. Um, actually, I, I probably don't even... I got it memorized, but I'll read it to you. It says... This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And that means those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words." Jesus said in John chapter 14 that he was going to prepare a place for you. And in the context, he was talking to the apostles. But it's for you, too. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare, pre prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again to you and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And in the same passage, he said, in my father's house are many mansions, in King James, literally many dwelling places. And he says, that's the place that he's going to prepare for you. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. That means he's going to heaven to prepare a place for you. And after he goes to heaven to prepare a place for you, he's coming back to receive you to himself. That where he is, which was heaven, you may be also. And he makes this connection with mansions because that's your dwelling place. That's where he's going to be taking you to. And in this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about the fact that when Jesus comes back, he comes back with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ rise first, and then everyone who's alive and remains is caught up. It's literally snatched away, taken away by force, is the word that's used in Greek there. Taken away by force, we meet the Lord in the air, and it says, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's the rapture of the church, okay? Now, having said that, let's look at this verse 1 and 2 again. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Oh, you know what? I've got to read something else to you. This is out of the Old Testament, before I, before I do the whole door thing. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 21, if you're, if you're taking notes, that's, that's an important one. Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 21, this is what Isaiah says. God, actually, God's speaking through Isaiah. He says, your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That's a resurrection. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you, 
hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is passed. The indignation in the Old Testament is the tribulation period. It's a, it's a term that's used for that. And so they are to come into their chambers and shut their doors behind them until that indignation is passed. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose her blood and no more cover her slain. So in that passage, you have this call from God to come. You have a mention of doors and chambers. And Jesus said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. And then they're told to come, uh, apparently, if you're, if I'm, you know what, if I'm saying, let me, let me put it this way. If I'm standing here and I say, come, enter into your chambers, what am I telling you to do? And what I'm telling you to do is come to me. If I'm saying, come, enter into your chambers, it means I'm sitting right there and you need to come to me to get into your chambers, Right? If I say, go, enter in your chambers, that's something significantly different. And that can mean go to every one of your houses and get in your house someplace, right? But if I say, come, that means I'm there. And obviously, you know, you see where I'm going with this whole thing? Again, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I think that one of the things that's going to happen when Jesus comes to get us and take us back to the place that he's prepared for us is he's going to say, come, enter into your chambers, Okay, so with that, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, let's read it again. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Remember that whole trumpet thing? Speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And that is why a lot of people think that when John gets to, to Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that this is a picture of the rapture of the church. It's not necessarily exactly what the rapture of the church is going to be, but it's symbolic in the sense that John is told to come up into heaven, pass through a door, and um, he's obviously in the throne room of God at that point. And in exactly the same way, that's what's going to be happening with you and with me. And so this is a great place to talk about the rapture of the church. And that's why I'm doing it here. The word rapture is one of those things that people fight over. And when you, whenever you talk to somebody about the rapture of the church and they've been um, taught that the rapture of the church doesn't exist or it takes place after the tribulation or whatever, one of the points that people will make is that the word rapture isn't even found in the Bible. Okay? And that's a half-truth. Okay? It's not absolutely true. But you know what? Just because something isn't found in the Bible doesn't mean that it's not biblical. The word trinity is not found in the Bible. Is there a trinity? Yeah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said that they're all one, and yet they're three persons. That's the doctrine of the trinity. And it's found in the Bible. Just because we give it a title doesn't mean it's not biblical. And so the fact that there's a title that may not be found in your English Bible doesn't mean that it's not biblical. That's a, that's a well, it's a fallacious argument. It's an argument that doesn't hold any water because it's just ridiculous. And in fact, it depends on which Bible you're reading. If you're reading the Latin Vulgate, the word rapture absolutely is found in the Bible. It's the word that means caught away. And literally, that's how uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is translated when it says caught up. And there's a Latin verb, rapir, that's used in that passage, and that's where we get the word rapture. Okay, so the whole idea that the rapture is not even in the Bible in the sense of the word and all that stuff, fallacious argument in the, in the first place, and in the second place, it depends on what Bible you're reading. If you're reading Latin, yes it is. And the, the translation of the word caught up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 um, can be the word rapture in English. So give me a break, is what I'm saying with that. When you talk about the rapture in the Bible, it's the blessed hope. Um, Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says that we are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Bible talks about the, the appearing of Christ, that point where he comes to get us as being the blessed hope. It's the biggest thing going in our lives, basically. You know, you go through life, you're walking with Jesus, and it's great to be here walking with Jesus, but I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to his coming to get me out of here. 
There's a lot of stuff that's going on in this world that's just making me sick at this point, and it's just ridiculous, and I want to get out of here. I don't care how I go. If God wants to kill me, that would be good. I don't care. If God wants to come in the rapture, that would even be better because we'd all be going together, and it would be awesome. Either one is good for me. I want to get out of here, and I'm looking forward to Christ coming for me. That's the blessed hope. That's one of the things that the Bible teaches that we're supposed to be looking forward to. In fact, did you know that the Bible says that there is a crown given to everyone who loves the appearing of Jesus? If your whole focus in your life, as far as being a Christian, major focus in your life is loving the appearance of Jesus, I can't wait, Jesus, until you get back here. Paul says you get a crown for that. That's a pretty simple thing. I'm getting that one. I know that's going to happen, right? Because I'm, I'm looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Same thing with you. And this is the point that I'm making here. Is the most important event that's going to take place for the church is the time when Jesus comes to take us out, translate us literally, and we meet him in the air. It's the most important event that's going to take place for the church, or it's supposed to be. If it's not in your life, you need to, you need to change attitudes because it's the most important thing going. And I'm going to bring that back up in just a minute here. There's a description of the rapture of the church, not only in 1 Thessalonians, but over, also over in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Why don't you turn there real, real quick with me. Matthew chapter 24. Starting verse 30, in verse 36. Jesus in this passage, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the whole thing on Matthew 24, but he's answering three questions. The first question that he's answering is, what will be the sign of your, or excuse me, what will, uh, when will these things be? And it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's a- answered in Luke chapter 21. Uh, it's a parallel passage with this. The second question that he's asked is, what will be the sign of your coming? And that's answered in verses 4 through verse 31 in this passage, the sign of your coming. And before the coming of Jesus to the earth, there's a bunch of stuff that takes place, including the tribulation period, and so you have it described there. And then the third question that he's asked is, what will be the sign of the end of the age? And when you get to verse 36, he's answering that question. What's going to be the sign of the end of the age? The age that we're in is called the church age. It's the period of time where Jesus kind of of takes a pause on the Jewish believers, takes a pause on Israel, and begins going out to the Gentiles and bringing in a group of people that are not only Jewish, but Gentile also. Jews and Gentiles coming in, making one body. It starts in Acts chapter 2. It's the age of the church. And the age of the church ends with an event that he's going to describe in verse 36 on. It says, But of that day and hour no one knows not, the, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So when you're talking about this event, no one knows the day or the hour. No one does. So when somebody tells you that they know when Jesus is coming back for the church, and they give you a date, you can automatically know that Jesus is not coming back on that date. In fact, it's one of those things that irritates me the most about date setters. They just tick me off. And so we're coming up on September... And what's going to happen in September is there's going to be this event that's, that's called the, um, Feast of, uh, the Feast of Trumpets. And every year around the Feast of Trumpets, somebody comes out with a book or a pamphlet or whatever saying that Jesus is coming back on the Feast of Trumpets. They need to stop it because that's going to be the day that he doesn't come back. As soon as they say it, it makes me irritated. So just stop it, okay? In any case... And there's, there's a whole thing to that, too. That's, that's really interesting stuff, too. In any case, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. When you're talking about the second coming, you can know the day or the hour. And here's why. The Bible says that uh, 1260 days after the Antichrist puts this thing in the temple called the abomination of desolation. 1,260 days after that event, Jesus comes back and kills him. He's destroyed with the brightness of Jesus' coming. And so as soon as that event takes place, you have a rebuilt temple, 
which is on the verge of taking place. You have a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. This guy, some dude comes in and, and sets himself up as God, sits down in the temple, proclaims himself to be God, and then leaves an idol there? The Bible says 1,260 days from that point, Jesus is coming back, that guy's toast. 1,260 days later. So I can just take my calendar and mark it at that point. And I'm going to know the day. And we could get into the hour too. There's a passage in Zechariah 14 that talks about the hour that Christ comes back. Zechariah chapter 14, Jerusalem time. He even mentions that. And so I can know the day or the hour, and the hour of the second coming of Christ. In fact, not only can I know it, the Bible, we're going to see this in Revelation. The Bible says that the kings of the earth know it, the ten kings who rebel against God know it, and they gather their armies to resist the second coming of Christ. It says that the demons know it because they gather the rest of the world to resist the second coming of Christ. They know when, they know where, they know what's going on. That's the second coming. And so Jesus is talking about another event. That's unexpected. And he says, Of that day and hour, no one knows, not at even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, I've heard all kinds of studies on, on this passage talking about the, the days of Noah and this whole thing with eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and, and they'll, they'll go through and talk about the evils that were taking place before the days of Noah. Absolutely true. There was all kinds of evil taking place before the days of Noah. Is eating evil? No, that's just kind of normal. Is drinking evil? Depends on what you're drinking and how much, but pretty much everybody has to drink something. So that's kind of normal. Is marrying normal? Yeah, that's pretty normal. There were some tweaked marriages going on before the, before the time of Noah, but yeah, marriage is, is normal. Is giving your, giving your children in marriage normal? Yes, and what Jesus is describing there is business as usual. They're going to be having parties. They're going to be eating and drinking. That's what that's talking about. Having parties, having get-togethers, that kind of stuff. They're going to be marrying and giving in marriage. Okay, when we go through the book of Revelation, what you're going to see is a situation where literally the oceans by the end of the tribulation period are all dead. There's nothing alive in the oceans. Um, a third of the grass, a third of the trees are all burnt up. You have uh, people dying left and right. In fact, in two of the judgments in the book of Revelation, literally half the population of the planet is gone. In just two of the judgments in the book of Revelation, half the planet is gone. I'm talking about people. Is gone, not half the earth, you know. But half the planet is gone. You got all these, the cities by the end of the, of the book of Revelation are knocked down. There are no more islands by the end of the book of Revelation. There are no more mountains by the end of the book of Revelation. It's an upheaval on a scale that you've never seen in a disaster movie ever. Nothing does it justice. And so it's a time of ultimate judgment on the planet. And so... You know, we're getting there towards the end, and right before Jesus comes back, you know, I plan my daughter's wedding. Seas are dead, mountains are gone, half the people on the planet are gone, there's wars everywhere, all kinds of plagues are taking place. Hey, we should have a wedding. Is that likely? All that stuff's going on. Hey, you want to come over for a party? We're just going to have a little get-together, you know, and when the 100-pound hailstones come and stuff, we'll just kind of dodge. You know, that kind of stuff. Instead of dodge, dodge ball, it can be called dodge hailstones. The Bible talks about 100-pound hailstones coming down and crushing everything. And so it's not a time when, th when business is as usual. And that's the difference between the time before the second coming and the time before Noah's flood. In both instances, there's all kinds of evil that's taking place. But in the time before Noah's flood, these guys had no idea that the judgment was coming. They had no idea that anything was going to happen. No idea, except for the preaching of Noah. It's the only thing that they had going for them, and they obviously didn't listen to that. In fact, there's some indication that before the flood of Noah, there was no rain on the planet. And so rain would have been a new concept to them, much less a flood. And so you have that situation. Business as usual, boom, judgment comes. That's the situation with Noah, okay? And so... 
It says, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so when Jesus comes for the church, it's going to be at a time that, that we do not expect in the sense of world events, in the, sec, in the sense of how things are going. In other words, it's one of those things that we have to be watching for, we have to be aware of, otherwise we're likely to miss it. And there's a lot of people on the planet who are in that exact position. In fact, a lot of people in churches are in that exact position. Now, one of the things that I do around here is I talk about Bible prophecy all the time. I talk about world events all the time. And so you are not in that position. So you're actually sitting there going, well, I can see some of the events that are leading up to this thing, and I'm aware of those things. But what I'm telling you is for the vast majority of even the church in America, you have a situation where they are clueless about what's going on in this world. In fact, we got major portions of the church in America saying that the, that the Jews over in Israel are no fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That, it's just that, the, that God's been done with the Jews forever. And that them being over there, they don't have any more right to that land than the Palestinians do. In fact, that's the majority of the church in America. The majority of the church in America believes that. And so they don't see Bible prophecy being fulfilled in their eyes. They're completely unaware of the events that take place before Jesus comes back to get the church out of here. Fortunately, you are not unaware of that. And even if nothing was going on, even if there was nothing going on that was a precursor to the stuff that we see in the book of Revelation, even if there were no events, Israel wasn't in the land or anything like that, Jesus said, you need to be watching and you need to be waiting for me because I'm coming at a time that you don't expect. In fact, the rest of that, the rest of that passage, if you look in verse 45, it says this, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And let me emphasize this. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. Oh, the abomination of desolation just took place. I don't think Jesus is coming. Oh, all the, all the life in the seas are dead. I don't think Jesus is coming. Oh, all the mountains got knocked down, all the islands are gone. Oh, I don't think Jesus, all the cities are destroyed. I don't, it doesn't fit. Again, it's a situation where it's business as usual and you have to be prepared. And this is what I'm saying to you. As we go through the book of Revelation, what we're going to see is that the world is being set up for every event that takes place that's listed in the book of Revelation. Whether you're talking about a cashless society or whether you're talking about a one world religion or whether you're talking about a one world government or even the judgments that are mentioned. Meteors actually asteroids falling out of the heavens and hitting the earth. Even the judgments that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, the world is being prepared for at this point. And what we see is basically a situation where all the precursors to the judgment in the book of Revelation are in place, set up, and that, and that kind of thing. And that's where we're living right now. That just makes the coming of Jesus for us all that much more close. And again, what I'm saying to you is that Jesus said that you need to be prepared for this no matter what, no matter what world events are taking place. Even if you see nothing on the horizon, even if you see nothing that's indicating that we're in the last days, you need to be prepared for the coming of Christ. Let me end it with this. Um, we'll, we'll do a little bit more of this next week because I just ran out of time. But Luke 12, or, oh no, I, I did it wrong. I got to do it in my Bible. Luke chapter 21 
Verse 35 through 40. Uh, Jesus said, actually verse, uh, verse 34. Um, Jesus said, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be watching and being ready so that we can escape all the things that he says are going to come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. That's exactly where I want to be. When all this stuff comes to pass, I want to be standing before the Son of Man. Where do you want to be? And again, you've got to be prepared for that. So we'll end it with that. Let me pray for you guys, and we'll get you out of here. Father, I just, again, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the way that it goes together. It's pretty cool stuff. And uh, Lord, we thank you also for the fact that you made it clear um, that you're coming back for us. You made it clear that you're coming back to take us home. And we're looking forward to that time, Lord Jesus. Um, we just pray that our hearts would be ready. Um, you said in that passage that we're not to be turning away, that we're not to be uh, turning towards the world and doing the things that the world does, and instead that we're supposed to be watching for you. And God, I just pray of all things that you would give us all an expectant heart. Um, I just am really convinced that you're coming back at any moment. Um, the, the, the world is going in directions um, that obviously you are not pleased with. And man, it looks like a setup for all this stuff in Revelation. Um, but Lord, you, you made a promise that um, we would hear your voice. We would hear the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and that we'd be standing before you before those things ever took place. So God, we just pray that you would help us to just have that expectation. And Lord, I know that any time that I'm talking about these things, one of the things that happens in believers' hearts is they start worrying about family members and friends who don't know you. And I think that there's a reason for that. Um, you, lo you, Lord, want us to have exactly the same heart towards those who don't know you that you do. And you know that the time is short and uh, that there is judgment coming and that people need to be delivered from that. And we just pray that you give that, give that same heart to us and that same expectation, that same desire uh, to turn things around in their life. And we ask that you do that for your glory's sake. Father, for these people, I just pray that you'd have your hand upon each one. Bless them, Lord, as they go their way. Uh, bless their week, Lord. And um, Father, I just pray that uh, we'd all be looking up because your return is drawing near. And we ask this all in Jesus' name.